suit up, strap in, warm the tires, and leave on yellow. Time for the Mitsu Times podcast, presented by MitsuTimes.org, the home of the fastest Mitsubishi cars, with your host, Josh. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Josh with Mitsu Times. Today, my guest is the owner and driver of the world's quickest and fastest V6-powered 1G, or V6-powered Plymouth Laser, I should say, Mr. Sean Werning. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, Josh. Hey, guys. How you all doing? Man, I'm doing great. Uh, I, your car has, uh, you know, I thought last year it blew up, but man, this year it's like uh, everybody was talking about it. So it, it's really putting on quite a show. Yeah, man, you know, uh, something I heard uh, like uh, Tony, Captain Tony say about the car, you know, it's it's photogenic. It looks good, right? Absolutely. Like, I think that catches people's eyes, right? They see the pictures of it and it looks so good in the pictures and they, they walk over and actually see what's going on and they uh, they come to some realizations. <laughs> Now, even now with the carbon Kevlar doors, it's like, man, it, you know, can it get any better? And I, I don't know what it is about modern cameras. They're just so friendly. It, my 2G was like that. It took great pictures, but then you'd walk up to the car and look at it. You're like, oh, <laughs> that's not what it looked like in the photos. <laughs> What's all this red tape? <laughs> you know, uh, I wanted to first uh, start talking about your YouTube channel because everything that we talked, we're going to talk about here. Well, most things we're going to talk about here, you can see on your YouTube channel, Fish Motorsports, and it's it's so crazy to see like your car in action and then kind of the behind the scenes of uh, you know why, how, you know I use this part and this part. You're not gatekeeping anything. This is like a full display of how to put a 6G75 into one of these cars. And you know, first off, I got to say thank you because it not only does it help the community out, but it's also so cool to watch you in action and you in the garage wrenching away on this thing. Yeah, man. That, you know, that's something I appreciate, and I, I guess it it goes back to the old forum days. You know, like I've. I've been on DSM tuners since I think 2003, 2004. And, you know, my, uh, my handle on tuners is two liter laser. You know, that's how my first car was a two liter laser. That's how long ago I've been on there. And I was very active on the, uh, the cult forums, 4G61T.org, super active on there. And, and that's just, I guess I just always have believed in that, that free sharing of information like that. Right. I mean, I don't know, like why gatekeep that? I mean, it's nothing, it's nothing special. Somebody else could figure it out. So why not just, why not just help them out? And then, we can go racing and have a good time and then we can compare notes, right? Helps everybody that's, go that's, racing. Yeah. Right. And that, that collaboration, usually it's a two way street, you know, you help somebody out and then they'll help you later. And that's, that's, what's been really cool with the V6 thing is as soon as I shared, I was putting this V6 in the, in the, uh, a one G I had guys just reaching out to me, sharing what they had done with V6s and mm -hmm. talking about their, their experience with V6s. So, you know, the, the V6 community is really cool. You know, it's, it's there. It's not, you know, the as a four cylinder guy, it's easy to think, ah, nobody's playing with those V sixes. But there really are. They're there. They're just off in their own corner doing their own thing. Right. And, and there is a lot of gatekeeping in the V six world, so it's nice that the the Facebook V six guys are like, Hey man, I did this, it didn't work, and then I did this and it did work. So I yeah, think it's the it, gate, it's really cool. The gatekeeping that I've seen are the guys who are really racing them. So, you know, I not to put anybody on blast or calling about out, but it's like the guys in Puerto Rico who they're trying to make money with these things, right. you know, like those, those are the guys, like they don't want to talk about their setup and and that's cool. I get that. And uh, there's a couple guys in Australia that run these things, run those V6s in a naturally aspirated class. And I've written them and they, they didn't respond to my very specific questions. Right. And then, and I get that because once, once they release that info to me, you know, even if I tell them, nah, man, I, I'm not going to tell anybody, they don't know that. Right. right. Like that's, once they've let it go, it's gone. So I get it. I don't, I don't hold that against anyone. You know, I understand. Um, but I will, you ask me a question, I, I will answer it. And I've, I've had, uh, I had a guy from uh, like Antigua write me recently, like during shootout or something, asking a bunch of questions about my setup. And I, I you know, I'll, I'll share and collaborate. I don't care. Yeah. You're, you're definitely the kind of person where if someone was to show up with a V6 1G next year at the shootout, you'd be like, man, that's, that's cool. Oh yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go pour over it, and we're gonna have an in depth conversation. <laughs> Love that. So, Sean, let's let's start it off big. Let's talk about the setup on this car. So, you know, as it is now, 
as it's sitting out in the garage now, it's a stock 6G75 with the MyVac locked onto the big lobes. I modified the solenoid and I modified the rocker so that it's always on the big lobes, never on the small lobes. Um, it's a stock 10 to 1 compression bottom end, so it's a non-MyVac bottom end for people who nerd out on that stuff. Um, it's got stock cams. There's no port work on the heads. The only thing that I've changed on the the long block, if you will, it's got the comp valve springs, and they're the Ford three valve, four point six liter valve springs, whatever. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it's got three thousand GT ARP head studs. Other than that, the thing's all stock. You know, when when I first put the bottom in together, I did gap the rings on the large side of naturally aspirated use, uh, per Wiseco's little chart that they have. Um, so you know. Even at that, it's not significantly larger than the stock the stock ring gap. Uh, the transmission, it's a mostly stock uh, 4A33. It's it's essentially the same thing as a 2G DSM transmission, but it's from a 3000 GT, so it's got the right bell housing pattern, so it bolts up to that that 6G75. And all that's in that transmission is the the Translab shift kit and some auto clutches. It's all stock. I don't have any of the the trick billet drums or anything like that. Wow. Um, well. Let me correct myself. I do have a IPT five friction front clutch in it, but big whoop, you know, yeah. like it probably would be just fine with the stock, front, but I had one sitting on the shelf. So in it, uh, other than that precision converter, uh, and a quaff diff in that trans. And then it, the, the biggest thing, the biggest hurdle with the car was the Holly setup. Um, but even that, like it's, I've got it set up. Basically it's a V6 Corvette. I'm running Corvette coils, GM sensors. And all I did was take and weld uh, a haggard mount off my oil pan that mounts the the crank sensor. Mm -hmm. And I took and bolted a tone ring to the back of the stock damper pulley and, you know, just set the depth and all that and made sure it lines up good. So other than that, you know, the Holly really wasn't that hard. It was just a learning curve for me figuring it out, which I hit up Jewer, you know, to help me with that. He likes the Holly stuff. So, you know, thanks, Kevin. <laughs> That's killer. I, I love the, uh, you know, the, the Corvette coils look so out of place on that valve cover, but then you think like, man, he's, he's really, uh, getting all he can out of that spark. So that, that's, yeah, I, I think you, yeah, I mean, you definitely killed it on that. The, the factory setup is individual coil on plug, but the plugs were different for the Mitsubishi coils. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just, you know what, let's, let's just use the, the coils that plug right into the Holly, the Holly harness. And I bought an off the shelf NGK, uh, again, Corvette, plug wire set and they just fit real nice so you know there's a lot of luck and stuff like that but i could have made my own my own wires if i needed to right and you know they i think they call what do they call that near coil it's not coil on plug it's near coil yeah um and i think i prefer that anyway because i like the coil on plug they've got that weird spring that like compresses and it just kind of sits on top of the spark plug i like feeling when i plug the spark plugs or the plug wires in i like feeling that click and oh, then I yeah, know sure. oh, this, this is, it's engaged. It's on there. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to get a clean spark. Right. So, uh, you know, I think before this, you were pretty much known as uh, the 2G front wheel drive guy. So what made you kind of come back to the 1G platform for this build? Uh, so my, we'll talk about this more. We've got another question that, you know, in the list later, but my first car was a 1GA laser. It was a 91. It was blue. So I've always kind of had a soft spot for these lasers. Um, this is my my second red 1GA laser. Uh, and, you know, just 1Gs are kind of my favorite. I've just always not really been super in love with 2Gs. And, and having a 2G and progressing and running a 2G, you know, reminded me uh, of those things that I don't like about them. They're heavier. I don't like the windows. That's all my buddies will, will have seen this coming from a mile away. <laughs> I hate that on the 2Gs, the top edge of the window is unsupported. Mm. So it's just floppy um so on my 2g i had gone in and had to go in and reset the the guides and and just constantly fighting these windows and they never lined up right and i just i hate that the first gens you've got that nice actual frame around the window and that just makes a bunch of different things easier like you know putting lexan windows in and stuff like that right um so you know this particular car it was for sale like an hour and a half two hours away from me and for a really good price um, so I just went and snagged it and I, I really didn't have like any plans for it at the time. It was just 
a nice 1GA laser and I wanted to have it. So I went and got it and brought it home with, you know, no real idea what I was going to do with it. That's killer. So whenever you bought it, it was a laser RS, but this, someone had, you know, done the factory option to have the 1.8 for whatever reason. Did was yeah, are, Whenever are, you picked it up, was it still, you know, pretty much in one piece? Yeah. Are, are you reading my notes? Because that's literally what the first sentence for this question in my notes is. Is all stock laser RS or someone option to have a 1.8? I watched all your videos to do research for this. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, Laser RS, that's the top of the line for the laser yeah. as far as, like, you know, creature comforts and stuff like that. So power windows, door locks, power steering AC, all that, right? But then, you know, rather than even having, like, a non-turbo 2-liter, let alone a turbo 2-liter, somebody had a 1.8 in it. And it had been overheated, and the head was warped, so the thing was taken apart. It didn't run. Um, then, like, you know, the head was laying in the back seat, and there was, mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, a kitchen pot full of nuts and bolts and stuff like that. And uh, I actually went through, I bought like an engine rebuild and a bunch of hoses and gaskets and stuff. I was going to put it back together as a 1.8 car to just drive around. Yeah. And I just never did. Like, I still have those parts sitting on my shelf. You know, I, it was all cheap rock auto stuff. So I put maybe a couple hundred bucks into it. But, um, you know, it just, it sat in my backyard for, I don't know, probably close to a year or even over a year while I was playing around with that 2G. So you said whenever you bought it, you had no original goals. You just wanted to put it back together and drive it, kind of like a winter beater or something like that? Yeah. So, you know, knowing that the 2G was heavy and the windows just constantly irritating me, you know, the, the initial thought was to take the drivetrain and the engine from the 2G and put it in the laser. And, you know, we knew my 2G went 10.4 at like 132 mile an hour um, at like, you know, 35, 36 pounds of boost. So we knew we could get a little bit more out of the turbo that was on the car. Uh, but we knew if we put that setup into this this 1G laser, same tires and all that, the thing would probably go a high nine, you know, just just due to being, you know, five, six hundred pounds lighter. Right. Um, so that was the initial thinking was just let's let's continue running this 2G until I've, I'm well and done with messing with this 2G and then we'll slam into this laser and we'll go have fun with this laser. But yeah, other other than that, that was it. OK, how did we get from that idea to the 675 idea? Yeah, that's. That's a good question. That's what everybody wants to know. Why, why this V6? So you'll like this. Um, you know, when I became aware of Mitsu times and started submitting slips for stuff, you know, then you want to go and look and see, like, how am I doing compared to other guys? And the Mitsu Times site is a great resource because you can see what other 60 foots are guys getting. You can look at the pictures of their car and see what tires they're running. You can see what turbos they're running. You know, you can see these just kind of like top level combo things to see what's going on. Um, so, you know, I'm checking the progress on my 2G as I'm going faster and submitting slips to you. And I noticed at the top of the front wheel drive list, there's all these V6 Mirages from Puerto Rico and they're all motor. So it's like, what's going on here? You know, how are these guys going, you know, deep into the nines and, you know, as fast as mid eights all motor with these V6s? Like, what do they know that, that we don't know, you know? So, uh, me and my buddies kind of started bench racing it, you know, and it's, larger displacement and you've got the myvec lobes which the myvec lobes are pretty good as far as cams go out of a factory car um for front wheel drives you know you got that heavier engine out front which is where you want weight on a front wheel drive so better weight distribution better torque you know on and on and on and on, and on you know um some of my friends were against it like you know they're like nah nah don't, we're not gonna do this v6 <laughs> stuff you need to keep playing with the two liters right but other guys were you know like that'd be pretty neat like you might you might be onto something there so I went to a went to a junkyard in Kentucky, uh, Bessler's Pull and Save, and and yanked an engine out of a Galant, and off we went. That's awesome. As soon as I started uh, catching wind of these six G seven five Mirages, I was like, "Whoa, hang on now, this is pretty cool." It, it was it was all through the Mitsu Time site. It was all through your site, Josh. Like I, I'd have never never would have seen it. Yeah. So I mean, that's you no know, thank you. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think one of the things that's so crazy about them is, you know, Mitsubishis have been drag racing for, you know, decades now, and we've never been known to have a good all motor engine. So the fact that this thing just came up out of the last few years and was like, hey, you know, we found out that we can, you know, shove nitro meth through this engine and it really wakes it up like. Man, that, that's that's just so yeah. cool that those guys are doing that. I mean, it seems like it's kind of uh, falling off now. I think if World Cup would allow their displacement to go down to 3.7 liters for the all-motor class, we might see more. But 
I don't know. Yeah, and we've done the math on that. Um, you can take and if you bore the 67.5, which there's a ton of meat in the cylinder walls to bore them, and if you use the crank from the 3.5 liter, you would come out like at a 3.690 or 9.2 or some, something like that. I, I can't remember what the math came out to be, but you'd be right at that 3.7 liter. Um, I think you would need... No, you can use the same rods because the... Maybe you'd need custom... Something like that. You would need some different combination, but... Um, it's doable. It's very doable. And you mentioned the all motor thing. I just wanted to add this. Did you see that Kurt, Kurt Stewart went an 11, nine yes. with a naturally aspirated two liter and an all wheel drive. Yes. That dude is bro. He's killing launching him. at nine grand. <laughs> so rowdy. I, every time I see his car, I mean, it seems like he's doing something different with it every season. He is, he's just like a madman for, you know, what he does and what he makes out of stuff. So Dude, it, yeah, yeah, it was crazy to see. Yeah, I, that was so cool. But you know, the V six is. I mean, it, it just it's a three point eight liter V six. It's big honking. You know, it's ninety five millimeter bore, ninety millimeter stroke. I mean, it just that's why we joke about it being the big block Mitsu. You know, yeah, like why sure. why aren't more people using these things? You know, now that your car has been so successful, and I mean, I don't want to jinx it, but been very reliable. I think people are going to start um, looking into it more. So the only issue I've had, um, I, I, I installed the valve springs wrong. I didn't shim them properly. So I didn't have good valve control. Um, so mushroomed the tops of some valves and damaged some lifters. So that that's on me for doing the assembly wrong. Um, but that was in the, the non MyVac heads. Most guys are going to go for the MyVac stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the bottom end is the same bottom end that I did that on. I, I, I broke two lifters and lifted the head on the back bank. And it, the, it didn't even, the bottom end didn't even care. It didn't, you know, I, I couldn't tell whatsoever that there was anything had happened in the bottom end. Um, so yeah, like I'm, I'm very impressed. You know, the, the calculators on the internet show for the car's weight in mile an hour and, and weight in ET that we're somewhere around like 550 560 horsepower wow which you know you got to take that with a grain of salt because those calculators tend to look at rear wheel drive automatic trans brake cars and you know we're front wheel drive automatic foot brake cars stuff like that um but it's you know it's somewhere 550 600 horsepower on that stock engine i mean that's you know i'm good with that i'm impressed with that definitely crazy to see what that thing can can push out on a stock bottom end yeah i mean i it's tempting to go lean on it more, but I'd really rather not blow it up or damage anything. You know, I'd, I'd like to be able to use that, that engine to build something later if I wanted to. And yeah. I've got another, another, uh, short block on an engine stand, but you know, why, why damage something if you don't have to? I got two long blocks extra. Oh, my Vex? Uh, yep. Ooh. Yeah. Cause I'm, <laughs> I'm also building a V6, but I, I think I'm gonna try to stay all motor. Oh, a, but so that'd be something, uh, that I'd like to talk about actually, like, uh, you know, since I had installed those valve springs wrong, um, the car only ever went 12 two all motor. And it's because I couldn't get the thing to rev past like 6,800, 7,000 RPM. It just wouldn't rev. It kept breaking up. And, you know, I, I, you know, I had some other guys like, Oh, it's a, this looks like a valve issue. And it's like, no, I put those stiffer Ford springs in there. It shouldn't be a valve issue. I had in my head that it was like a dwell issue with the coils or, we were running too rich and the coils couldn't fire or, you know, I had in my head, it was like a Holly issue. Um, and it wasn't until we put the turbo on that it started to exasperate and, you know, just be more and more of a problem. Then Kevin took a look at a log and Kevin goes, you've got valve float. And, you know, I kind of threw my hands up and went, fine, I'll take it apart. It's got valve float. And sure enough, it did. But, uh, you know, I wish I'd have kept the car all motor longer because I, I really think we could have got a lot more out of it. Yeah. Yep. I've I've never uh, played around with all motor, so I'm pretty excited. We're getting the the cage work done now. We were hoping to have it done before the shootout, but it was not to be. That's that's kind of where I'm at with my car now. Is uh, we know you know with going nine five, I should already have a ten point in it, and all it has is a five point roll bar, which is good for ten o per NH NHRA. Um, so you know we're kind of deciding: are we going to do like a twenty five five? Yeah. Or are we going to just do a ten bolt? A, you know, a ten point. Am I going to pay somebody to get to do it? Am I going to do it myself? You know, that's kind of where we're at right now. 
too scared to do stuff like that myself. Uh, you know, I, I've got the bender. I've done stuff like that. Uh, I'd probably have to buy the die, which the damn dies are expensive, but then I'd have it. Yeah. So I don't know. You know, like it's it's time and effort. And if it's not something that you've got a bunch of experience doing, it's easy to mess up. And then you just kind of junk a whole 10 foot, 20 foot stick of chrome molly, you know. So, yeah, I don't know. Well, you know, we were talking about those V6 Mirages and the success elsewhere in the world. How does it feel to, uh, I mean, you didn't debut this car at the shootout, but damn near, really. How does it feel to jump straight onto the top 10 of the uh, 6G75 list? Yeah, you know, the car kind of hacked me off 2022 for it not meeting the goals, you know, and it wasn't the car's fault. It was my fault, but I didn't touch it all winter, and it wasn't until uh, Streetcar Takeover Indy in the in the like the late spring early summer that i decided to hang a turbo on it and go go make that happen and i did that in like two weeks i had to fabricate manifolds and hang an intercooler and make charge pipes and all that um and it we had issues up there we didn't we made like one pass but it was leaking oil real bad and all that um so for having like kind of thrown it together all quick quick again it you know feels real good for the car to have performed the way it has you know i I'm like anybody else. I like seeing my name further up the list, but uh, you know, I, I'd really like to be faster than those all motor guys because uh, you know, I'm sure there's at least one of them that's looked at it and went, "Ha! Look at this guy. He's got a turbo and he still can't beat us." You know. <laughs> well, I think uh, nitro meth also has a lot to do with that. I know, and you know, I try to be careful with that because on, on your side it all says methanol, and unless you got a fuel sample and tested it right, like they can kind of play that game, but. We know, like, we can do the numbers. Like, even if it's a 1,600-pound race weight, you know, car plus driver, that's 700 horsepower to get to the mid-8s. Like, you're not doing that all motor with a 3.8 liter. Like, it, yeah. we know what's going on. But, uh, yeah, like, that's, you know, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd really like to be further up the list just so I can uh, kind of be in there with those guys, you know, and not quite past uh, LMVP, but somewhere up in there with them. Yeah. But, no, it's really cool, dude. Like, I, you know. The car has been real good to me and the setup's been real good. It's kind of worked out how we bench raced it, you know, in our minds. Um, and, you know, it, that's really all I can say on it is uh, there's been some luck, but I, I have definitely put in a lot of hours of taking it apart, putting it back together, troubleshooting. Um, and it, you know, it gave back what I put into it. Heck yeah. So how does it feel to uh, break into the nines at the shootout, especially after all the not setbacks from last year and, and or, you know, late spring, early summer, but, uh, not getting where you wanted to be. Yeah, you know, talking about setbacks, I had way more setbacks this year. We uh, we had a solenoid in the transmission that was intermittently dying, and it wasn't until it fully died that we finally found the issue. Uh, um, so that was, yeah, transmission in and out like three, four times leading up to shootout. Uh, and that kind of had me low, you know, on the whole thing. Like maybe this, maybe maybe the V6 was making too much torque, stuff like that. But uh, as far as talking about shootout, like uh, – Shoot out something that that I've been going to for a long time, and I always look forward to it. Like uh, I missed a few years, but I've been going since I think like 2007, 2006, 2007. Um, dude, like you know, it's just it shoot out such a big part of of my life and all my buddies' lives. Like that's it. Like we're all like everybody that I hang out and talk to. Like we all go to shoot out together. So you know, with my 2G, we broke some barriers at shoot out. Um, but you know, like when you're talking about going 12s or 11s, like you know, that's cool. That's really cool personally, but nobody really gives much, you know, doesn't pay much attention to that. Mm -hmm. It's that, that single digit, right? Like when you've got a nine <laughs> as the first number, right? Like that's what people really start to pay attention to. Um, so the, the fact that the car was working and doing what we wanted <clears throat> and just, you know, the past that I went, all right, let's, let's add some power into it and let's see if we can get a nine out of it. You know, that was really, really cool. You know, the car was just doing what, what we needed it to do. And it happened. Um, we, uh, me and my buddies, we still talk about stuff that we did with the 2G at shootout. And, you know, I know what we did with the laser here just in 2023 is something we'll be talking about for a long time, let alone, you know, what, what we're hoping to do in the future. For sure. I, I, it's definitely one of those things where it's like, man, we, we went there and did that. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll share the, the 2G. We went up there to run 12.5 index and this was in, uh, 2021 maybe 2020 or 2021 which which year was shootout canceled due to covid was that 2021 2020 2020 wow maybe it was 2019 i'd have to go back and look um 
actually the the video is on my whatever we'll figure it out but uh we went up there to run 12.5 and i had just recently gone to 12 at edgewater and it was like a super high 12 or something like that or maybe i hadn't even gone a 12 i'd gone like a 13 or something but so we went out and we ran the car and it went a 12.7 so we're like all right we're gonna bump up the launch limiter a couple hundred rpm and we're gonna add a few more pounds of boost and it was a stick car on an open diff so it's like you know super track sensitive and depends on how you drive the car you know like big big differences pass to pass right mm -hmm. so you know we, we like sniffed a little bit more boost into it and up the launch limiter a couple hundred rpm like maybe 400 rpm hardly anything and we went out and we were like just trying to get two tenths out of the car like we were just trying to get that 12.7 to be a 12.5 so we go and we make the pass and the thing went 1190 and if you go and find a video on youtube like the one my one buddy tim is just laughing like a madman because here we're like hoping this thing just gets us two more tenths so that we got a good a good dial in for running the index and it screams down the track to an 1190 and i i remember passing through the traps and the speedo is like well north of 120 mile an hour and i'm like that can't be right you know like <laughs> this thing's only going like 115 117 mile an hour you know i'm like no way no way so I roll around and I get my slip from the from the booth and you know it's 1190 at like 121 or something like that and I'm like just losing my mind like no fucking way you know like good grief so like you know that's that's what we talk about all the time is just like oh yeah we'll just sniff a little bit more boost into it and we'll drop eight tenths you know <laughs> she was on a pass yeah it was good this episode of the Mitsu Times podcast is brought to you by RP Motorsports. Born from the love of cars and a passion for performance, RP Motorsports is a licensed automotive mechanical workshop and parts supplier based in Southeast Sydney, Australia, specializing in performance vehicles. With over 20 years of experience, the team at RP Motorsports have built up a wealth of knowledge that allows them to tackle almost any job, from simple servicing tasks to full house performance builds with confidence and precision, delivering results above and beyond expectations. Experts in performance upgrades for all makes and models, including Evo and Twin Clutch SST Gearbox Specialists. If you're looking to boost your car's performance and reliability, RP Motorsports can make that happen. Find out more about their products and services at rpmotorsports.com.au. So I wanted to talk about the final there where uh, in your video you can see the back lifting up. Do you think that's a downforce uh, problem or do you think it's just something oh, with the car? Oh, no, 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 no. We, we know what this is. Okay, so fast front-wheel drive drag cars are very front-heavy weight biased, and that's what you have to do to get the car to plant and get out of the hole, mm -hmm. right? Like, we've we've now gone a 148, 60-foot, I think it was a 148, something like that. Um, and, you know, with a front-wheel drive car, you don't get it to do that unless you've got, like, 75% front weight bias, which I think we're at, like, 72, 73% with the car currently. And I know that there's some Hondas that run like 80% front weight bias. So when you do that and you run the skinny tires in the back, it becomes real dangerous to get on the brakes too hard because all that weight will transfer even further forward uh, and make the back end lighter. And it'll lock up those back wheels and then you spin because now there's nothing breaking the rear end. So the rear end's going faster than the front end. So it spins around, it swaps ends, right? Gotcha. So there's no back brakes on the car. And that's, that's something I learned from observing the Honda guys. You know, it's like, wait a minute, why does this car not have back brakes? And I, Joe Bucci knows this too, because his car used to not have back brakes. Um, so on that pass that you can see in my video, I was getting ready to go to the brake. So I moved my foot over and had it, you know, near the pedal. And what happened is my foot just barely pushed on the pedal enough to engage the launch limiter. There's a switch on the brake pedal that I'm using to engage the launch limiter back at the start line. So the engine went from 7,500 RPM under full steam to cutting all fuel in, in spark, trying to get back down to the launch limiter of 3,000 RPM. Oh, man. So it engine braked so hard that the back end came off the ground. And, uh, you know, we don't have any video evidence of this, but it, what it probably did is wad up one of the slicks. And when it wadded up the slick, I drove over it, you know, I drove over that wad and it made the car feel like it hopped. So at the time I didn't know what had happened. I thought I had cut a tire. I thought I like drove over an axle, you know, like all I know is the car pitched forward and then hopped. And I like, you know, I thought I was going into the wall. Um, so it wasn't until, you know, I got back to the pit and I, they, 
my butt, my guys jacked the car up and they went over everything. I'm like, we broke an axle. We cut a tire. I'm like, you know, something happened to this thing. They poured over it and they're like, we can't find anything wrong. So I'm digging through the data log and I finally found where right, right when the RPM dropped like that, the limiter switch was engaged. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, okay. Like I know what I did. You know, my foot bumped the brake pedal. Well, I'll freely share this with, with you and your listeners. Uh, what led to that is I had forgot to put the brake return spring back on the brake pedal when I reinstalled the pedal assembly in the car. So the brake pedal was just kind of loose. It didn't have any resistance holding it up. And uh, my switch wasn't as close to the pedal as it should have been to, you know, prevent that kind of stuff. So oh. we've since rectified that. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's the Holly, unfortunately, doesn't turn off the launch limiter with mile an hour. Um, ECM link, you it, it by default does that, like past a certain mile an hour, it turns off the launch limiter. And I've actually called Holly and to get them to help me get that implemented with the the terminator that i have and you just can't do it oh wow um so yeah maybe with the dominator you can do an advanced table or something like, like that but with the terminator you just simply can't do it so i was gonna say I hate uh, to, there's other strategies i hate to but, see a drag wing on on a laser like that the rear ends of the lasers just look too good yeah so i am gonna go get the the carbon kevlar drag wing that matches the doors uh the guy that bought those from joe held agreed to sell them to me i think that's oh, actually going to happen this coming weekend yeah um I think it'll look okay. I don't. I don't think it'll break up the back end too bad. I'm gonna leave the Chrysler taillights on the back of that thing. Um, I think it'll look good. Yeah. And then. And we're also like we're gonna move to a parachute too. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, yeah. That way, if you feel like that again, at least you got something to save your butt. <clears throat> yeah, uh, and you know, the parachutes do tend to lift the back of the cars up, especially the the front wheel drives, but. Um, the drag wing will help with that. And at least the parachute will be linear. You know, it's going to pull in a straight line. Yeah. Well, good deal. It sounds like you really got some good upgrades planned. I, I know in your video, you talked about how it could still lose weight. And I'm just thinking like, man, I wonder, you know, how it, it's crazy to think of how much more this thing could really go with, with the setup you have now. Yeah, I mean, again, I'll, I'll freely disclose the car's uh, 2,180 pounds without me. Um, I'm 208, 210 pounds, so our race weight's usually like 2388, 2390, somewhere around there. Um, but with like, uh, you know, the class to be running in front wheel drive is X front wheel drive, right? That's the, the World Cup final and all that. And the minimum weight is 2,400 pounds, and that's car plus driver. So, the tactic is to get the car as light as you can and then you put ballast in so you get your corner corner weights good and your weight distribution good so you know the fast front wheel drive hondas they'll have like 400 pound weight plates up on the front right because they get all the weight out of the back half of the chassis and they just plant it over the front axle um and i i don't know you know given that i'm already going one four sixties I don't know that I'll need to do all that for sure. Um, but you, yeah, like we still, we want to, we know we got to put a, a bigger cage in, so that's going to add some weight. Um, there's, you know, I need fire suppression. I need a parachute, you know, stuff like that. All that kind of stuff's going to add weight. So we're going to get out, all the weight out of it that we can. And, you know, where I mentioned there's still weight to come out, it's the hatch. Um, it's, you know, maybe the corner window glass, but they're so small, probably won't mess with those. Uh, the rear axle, on those cars it's a heavy tag axle you can you can change those to something that's aluminum or at least like a tube chrome or something like that you can lose a lot of weight there oh, okay um can't can't cut up the car you know per the x front wheel drive rules but there's some other places that we could drop a little bit more weight yet too and you still haven't moved your fuel cell like in front of the engine or anything like that like those guys have yet either Right. I, and I don't know that I will. Uh, you know, NHRA is real particular about your fuel lines not running past your like either flywheel or converter in the event the thing would explode. Um, so it might move. It might move, but we'll see. Um, but I, I kind of just have a thing about having the fuel cell like out in the front of the car like that. Like, man, like, because if the car is going to wreck, it's either going to hit back end or front end or the side. If it hits a side, cool. But if it hits front end and the first thing it hits is your fuel cell, like that to me that's just kind of a personal like, ugh. I don't know. Um and you see a lot of those cars yeah, battery on one side, fuel cell on the other and you're like, man, it, all it takes is front look, end collision like, look, really make this thing bad. Yeah, look at look at Pro Mods. Pro Mods will have a giant fuel tank like right out front. Like, you know, the first thing that's going to hit if it goes into a wall and I just I don't know. I you know, I'd rather not <laughs> 
front wheel drive is already sketchy enough, let alone if you're in the middle of a pass and an axle decides to let go, you know, that car is going to shoot one way or the other. And we kind of saw that at a uh, at shootout with that, that Honda against Demon. You know, he shot the one side, and I, you know, I don't know for sure, but it looked to me like an axle let go yeah. when he tried to send the car down the track. Yeah. That was crazy that both cars seemed like they broke axles at the same the point problem. on the track. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and that's so, like, just on on brand for Norwalk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, one, the one year they get the track surface right. <laughs> so you talked about your upgrades for the future. Let's talk about just the goals for the rest of this year and next year. I mean, if people aren't keeping up with you, uh, you're racing, it seems like, every weekend, uh, sometimes in the middle of the week. I, I mean, you're not one of those where the, the shootout is it. You, you're out there getting it. Yeah. My local track is Edgewater, and they've had a lot of Thursday night testing tunes this year. I um, mean, I think it's because they're, they're doing, like, uh, racing on Friday and Saturday and stuff like that. So that's kind of the middle of the week. Um, the other local-ish track to me is Kill Care. Their testing tune night is, is Thursday, so it doesn't uh, conflict with uh, Edgewater's typical Friday night. Um, but otherwise, I think 2023 is done for me. I, I'm not going to take the car apart just yet. Um, it might go back out a couple times just for fun, but I'm not going to push for anything else. You know, I'm, I'm very, very happy with that 9.5. Uh, but, you know, knowing that the car needs safety and it's sketchy at, at speed without a, a shoot or a wing or anything like that, like, I'm good, you know. Um, but for 2024, you know, we got, we got a lot to do. Um, and that's, you know, that's what, what we're talking about and kind of figuring out the pathway and the plan for, you know, is, uh, um, get safety into the car first and then actually, you know, build an engine and start working with different cams and, uh, you know, different transmission parts and stuff like that and, and try to really, really go fast with the car. Yeah. That's killer. I love that. So do you have any, um, is there like a number in mind? Like you really want to run a, a 9.0 or something that, that is just like your ultimate goal? Or do you just want to be on top of the 67.5 list? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'd be down with being at the top of the 67.5 list, but I don't, I don't know that that's really like the goal. So in my mind, um, I'd like to go in eight in this chassis and engine combination, uh, regardless of what transmission it takes. And it'll probably be an automatic uh, and regardless of power, you know, we've we've ran the numbers through the calculator, assuming a 2,400 pound race weight, and it, it it'll be around a thousand horsepower. Um, so if that's what it takes, then that's what I'll do. Um, you know, we've talked about fuels and and stuff like that. You know, what what we can get away with as right. far as uh, fuel setups and so forth. But uh, yeah, I'd like to go eights, and you know, I'd like to put a, a, a either a 10 point or a, a 25x cage in it and max it out at an 8.5. Um, but you know, this, this chassis was my first nine and I've now gone four four nine second passes with two of them being a nine, six and one being a nine, five. Uh, I'd like to get us, get this to be my first eight second chassis. Um, and then as far as going faster than that, I've got, I've got a rear wheel drive chassis that I'm kind of holding on to and oh. I've had for a long time and that, that'll be, yeah, that, that'll be the, the goal for going any faster than that. But, uh. So, you know, eights and thousand horsepower is kind of the, the short term goal. Okay. Um, index racing is a lot of fun and I really do enjoy it, but I, I would like to go and be able to do heads up racing and, and to be able to do it successfully. And, uh, you know, I think the V6 has a lot to lend towards that. You know, I can, I can just instant spool a turbo and get up on the converter. No problem. I mean, I don't have to get up on the the two-step and then start bumping in i can just bump in and just whenever i'm good nail the throttle now granted that's on a 62 62 and with a bigger turbo there might be a little bit more drag but where's the limit you know let alone if we bore it out to a larger displacement and it's a, a small bore i think it's a 40 thousandths bore and the thing becomes a four liter wow. so you know it's kind of got that yeah it's got that big motor stuff where small changes with your stroke and your your piston bore give you big differences um so you know i like i think i can have a really solid eight second platform that i don't have to worry about lifting heads and coughing out gaskets and you know weird stuff like that um so I, i'm kind of looking forward to it we just we got to get there yeah well you know being able to do that without having to uh constantly change out engines between passes and stuff like that I, that's yeah i i think that that yeah. would be really something that would that would shake up a lot of people yeah, or, you know, having the rev so high and having such 
high cylinder pressure for each individual cylinder, right? And that's, you know, when you talk about making 100 horsepower per cylinder, you know, for a 4G, you only get 400 horsepower. For a V6, you get 600, right? But then when you start talking about making 1,000 horsepower, that's 200, 250 horsepower per cylinder on a four-cylinder. Yeah. And I can't remember what it is on a V6, 175 or something like that. But, um, you know, that, that stuff does matter because that's you, your pistons are having to hold that, your cylinder heads having to hold that, your rings are having to hold that, you know, so it's a little bit less stress on the components when you spread that out across more cylinders. Um, the V6 runs a little bit smoother, so it's easier on some of the drivetrain components, just stuff like that. You know, I'm not going to have to, I'm not going to have to rev the thing to 10,000, 12,000 RPM to do what I want to do. Mm hmm yeah, when you talk about um, putting as much horsepower per cylinder in one cylinder as the engine entire engine made from the factory, then you're really you're you're pushing the outer edges of the limits there. Oh yeah, right. Let alone you look at cars like like Demon and stuff. You know, they're fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred horsepower. Like good grief. Yeah. I mean, it just lots and lots of power per each individual hole. So you you've had a. a pretty interesting fleet of uh, Mitsubishi vehicles. I'd like to uh, get some of the stories of some of the uh, the ones that meant the most to you. Sure. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier on, my, my first car was a 91 Laser RS non-turbo, and it was the, uh, oh shoot, it was the the electric blue. Uh, Bonsai Blue was the, the color name. Nice. Um, so I was 15, so I, I did what every 15 year old does to their first car. You know, I, I fucked the poor thing up. It was a <laughs> real clean, real nice car, and I uh, proceeded to put junk eBay coilovers on it and messed it up. You know, the the cool thing that we did though is, you know, this is 2003. We turbo swapped that car, and at the time, I remember asking on tuners, "Hey, what do I, what do I need to? Do? I'm planning to do this. What what input do you guys have?" And I was told, "You can't. You should just buy a turbo." Well. My dad worked at a Dodge dealer. I had access to factory Dodge and Mitsubishi uh, manuals and scanner tools. So we made it happen. Um, I went and got out of the junkyard a, a pink with tan interior, 1GA laser, and I swapped it over. And then we got rid of that god-awful pink and tan car. <laughs> um, and, you know, we had a lot of fun with that car until a tree fell on it and kind of ended its life. And uh, I still have dreams about that car. You know, like it's sitting in the woods somewhere, and we go get it and fix it, and we're driving around in it and stuff like that. But... uh it's gone. It, 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 it got crushed. But uh, so other than that, I've had tons and tons of 1Gs, 1GAs, 1GBs, all wheel drive, front wheel drive, turbo, non turbo. I had a 420A Avenger that I auto crossed and I really liked. Sick. Um, I've had Colts. I've had Summits. Um, I had a really cool all wheel drive Colt that I got a, from a guy locally. I bought the chassis. He had already done the swap on it and I put a, a two liter back in it and went and did, did some fun stuff with that. I was still learning how to tune. Um, I wasn't familiar with the term rich knock. So I had like a Gretti 18 G and some PTE 850 injectors. And I can see on the wide band that it's like, you know, 10 O to one AFR and the thing's knocking. And I'm like, why is this thing knocking? It's rich. It shouldn't be knocking, you know? So I ended up trading that car for a, a Gallant VR4 from a, a guy in Colorado and actually drove this cold all the way to Colorado to pick up this Gallant, oh, drove wow. it all the way back. Yeah, and that was a, it was a Belize Green 91, and it was number 981 out of 2000. Yeah. Every time I see a Belize Green, that's why I don't know if you've seen me on Facebook. I'm, every time I see a Belize Green, I'm like, what number is this? <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I see, as soon as I find 981, I'm probably going to try to buy it again. I don't know why. Like, it's just a Belize Green 91, but something about that first Galant VR4, right? Oh, for um, sure. I had a Summit. Yeah, I had an all-wheel drive Summit van. Uh, I've had Conquest, Monteros. Uh, my wife likes 3000s, so like we had a VR4 3000, and uh, she doesn't like driving sticks, so we ended up trading it for a really nice uh, front-wheel drive, and now she's got a, a different one, whatever. Um, now I've got the laser that we're talking about, but I've got another Gallant VR4. It's a, a 92, and it's a Kensington Gray, and it's number 87 out of 1000, and that's wow. that's something that I've been holding on to. I'm planning on doing like a, a, a restoration series on my YouTube channel. Um, just got to find the time. Yep, we're going to have to all quit our day jobs so we can make more content. Yeah, I mean, I've con I've considered, uh, you know, trying to hire an editor, but I can't imagine it's cheap, and it's not like my channel is monetized, so mm, yeah. I don't know. Well, you come from a, a 
well, a pedigree of uh, Mitsubishi fans, let's say. Your brother, your dad, everybody's in on it. So I want to talk about some of your your family's cars because we've seen uh, – your brother wasn't racing, but he was definitely in your pit crew. And then, of course, your dad was racing in max effort. So let's talk about some of their cars. Yeah, and, dude, it's even deeper than that. So my notes here starts with my mom's 1990 Talon TSI. Oh, that's right. You told um, me about that. I forgot so, that. Yeah. My mom's in on this. So my dad was working at a Dodge dealership and this, it was purple. It, it looked just like John Shep's seven second town. It was the two tone purple and silver. Um, wow. Came in with a broken timing belt and my dad bought it from the guy and then was paid to fix it because <laughs> it, it had the, the timing belt recall at the time. And then my mom drove it for a super long time. Like this poor car, it rotted away. And like the drive line and everything was so crusty when they were finally done with it that like I didn't even want it. It had over like it had like two hundred and fifty something thousand miles, Holy like just cow. a stupid amount. Yeah, like and towards the end of its life, Dad had been kind of band aiding it along, keeping it alive. Um, but like, you know, they had it for a long time. So when I turned fifteen, you know, Dad asked me like, "What kind of car do you want?" Oh my gosh, sorry. No, you're good. I even have my phone. I even have my phone on Do Not Disturb, but apparently there's a uh, an Amber, Amber alert. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Nothing will stop so, us. Yeah. When I was 15, you know, dad asked me what, what, what do I want for my first car? So I want a car like mom's and he kind of like, kind of laughed. He's like, well, I'll, I'll find you one that's not turbo. Um, and that's, that's where I got that laser. Uh, but dude, since then, like, uh, you know, Starling has had a couple of one G's, uh, dad has had all kinds of different stuff. Um, but, and now he's got that black two G Talon. That's a 428 car that he's been, I don't know this year. He kind of drug his feet on it all the way up until shootout. And he had issues with it at shootout cause he had just thrown it back together. Um, but he's got plans. And then another brother of mine named Remington, uh, he's got a silver 420A Eclipse that's an auto that we, we've kind of got some plans with. We got to kind of see what kind of commitment he's into on that. Um, and then you mentioned Starling, and that's that's the brother who's been in my pit crew for a while now. You know, he uh, he's the guy that put a motorcycle engine in that red Colt that was up at shootout last year, yeah. 2022. Right? You know, just why craziness right could have put a 4g in the front of the thing no nah, let's put a stupid v-twin motorcycle engine in it um but he recently bought a a silver colt uh from this guy down in indiana like just north of louisville and uh he's got plans to to do some stuff with that and go racing he's already made the interior look a lot better than when i had it well that was the interior from that red car yeah as soon as i seen it i thought dang this thing uh this thing had some potential yeah, but uh, so we're a family of racers. We raced BMX for a long time, and then we kind of got into kart racing. And my brothers did dirt kart racing, and I did a little bit of a little bit of circuit track racing. Um, and I got into autocross. So then everybody else kind of got into autocross. Um, and the whole time I've kind of had DSMs and Colts and stuff, and you know, doing the street racing thing. Not for not anything glorious, but you stoplight racing and going out and just kind of hitting back roads and having a good time. Right. Um, so, you know, that's just, we, we've raced motorcycles. Like we did, uh, the hair scramble racing where you're flying through the woods, at 40 mile an hour trying oh, to wow. die. Um, yeah, we just, we've done, uh, we've done five Ks, you know, like we just, we're racers. Like we like that kind of competition, you know, that, that's, that's what makes our lives go around. All right. So <laughs> Sean, I, I, you, you've had so many one G's that your advice has got to be, uh, you know, pretty valuable. So if someone out there, they, they have a one G it's pretty close to stock and they're thinking about just trying to get it a little bit quicker or just trying to prolong its life. What advice would you have them? Would you give them for their build? And like the biggest thing that I see, and I've been guilty of it myself. So, you know, I'm not trying to high horse anybody, but don't try to run before you walk. And that is such a DS th DSM thing to do, right? Like we get caught up in what other people have done that we're like, oh, I can do that. And you don't know what you don't know. Like unless you've been there and done it already, there's a bunch to learn. You know, I'm, I'm learning every day. Like I, you know, I enjoy that. I'm constantly trying to get connected with other smarter people than me and, you know, try to get, get what I can from them without getting on their nerves or being a, uh, the term is ask hole, you know, <laughs> um, but that's that's it. Don't try to run before you walk. You know, don't try to run tens before you've gone twelves. You know, right. it's there's a big difference. You know, and yeah, they're turbo cars, but it it's never just as easy as putting more boost into. It. Um, you know, this is where I'll soapbox a little bit. So many projects end up living on jack stands because 
people jump into them not knowing what they don't know and they don't have they don't have the skill set yet for doing what they what they ultimately want the car to do um and it's a shame because you know when they started with a car that was running and driving they could have left it running and driving and enjoyed the car as it was and then the car is getting used and the, they're getting enjoyment from it you know rather than it just kind of sitting around rotting away um and if if someone's starting with a non-running project then be realistic about what you can do and afford to do from both a money and a time standpoint, right? If you've got the time for wrenching on the thing, then cool. Do you have the money? And if you don't, then that's okay. You know, just do what you can within your own restrictions and limitations, right? I mean, that's right. that's a big deal. You know, like I know it seems you mentioned, you know, I'm racing all the time and stuff like that. Like it's like cars are my life, but my net worth isn't growing. <laughs> You know, I'm not I'm not making myself wealthier racing. I'm having to spend a lot of money to do this right, right. now. So I got to step back from that and I got to get back to making some money and, and you know, paying my bills and stuff like that uh, so that I can go racing again. So it's, that's an important side of things. You got to make sure the rest of your ducks are in a row before you can go and start shooting those ducks at the racetrack. Um, I've also got in my notes here something I wanted to talk about was, you know, Dave, David Freiberger from Hot Rod, Motor Trend, uh, you know, Roadkill. He's been saying this thing for a while now, don't get it right, just get it running. And that's so true. Like, you know, as long as the, the car is not going to destroy itself and it's not a safety hazard for the driver or the people in the car or, or on the road with you, then just get the thing running. Don't worry if it's got a giant turbo. Don't worry if it runs tens, nines, whatever. Like, just go have fun with the car. Yeah. Go to the track, get, get your ass beat, but go learn something and go meet people and go have a good time. If autocross or track racing is your thing, go get there, right? Like the car being on jack stands or in the garage isn't you know i like working on them and other people like working on them but driving them is way better absolutely uh, you know i think back to what you said and i see it, it seems like the i wouldn't you know i'm not putting down anyone but it seems like the newer uh generation of dsm owners are like oh i'm i'm take down the demon All right, well you know first you need to run a, a 12 and and you know work your way from there, enjoy the, the bolt on turbos and find out, yeah. you know, all the things that, that Devin Schultz learned before he got to where he is now. There was a guy on Facebook. Um, I, I, I don't want to name a name for a couple of reasons, but he had said something about all oh, this car should run a 10 easily. And it, it kind of struck a chord with me because, you know, been there, done that. I know what it takes. So I remember, like, Hey man, have you, you know, you, I see you're running 10 index and you think this thing's going to run a 10 easily. Have you gone a 10? Have you gone near to a 10? You know, and he'd respond, well, no, but, and, you know, I was kind of like shaking my head, like, all right, we'll see. Well, you know, this particular guy showed me what's up. Like his car did go an easy 10 and I'm pretty sure I ended up getting a nine out of it at shootout. But, you know, that's the thing is like, you got to learn and you got to progress your way up there. Yeah. Um, it's, it's much harder if you think you're just going to slap a GT4202 onto your, your engine and just go scream yourself your way into an eight. You got some, you got some hard truths coming your way. Absolutely. And, and some financial setbacks coming your way. Yeah. That's, you know, you either, uh, what, what, what's it? You, you can have it, uh, it can be fast, it can be good, or it can be cheap, but you can only have two and not the third. Yep. Right, something like that. Yeah, fast, cheap, reliable. <laughs> I think. Yeah, some, something like that. Yeah, fast, cheap, reliable. Right, something like that. Right, like, you know, there's always some, some kind of sacrifice you have to make, be it money or time or maybe even both. So, Sean, you said, uh, you know, you you might be done racing for 2023. Uh, do you? W let's talk about your events for 2024, where we can come and see this car in action. I wish I had a. a I wish I could like read off a schedule to you that I've got planned out, but uh, I'm not there. I don't have a, a nice schedule mapped out, but uh, the, the events that I tend to run are streetcar takeover. Yep. Um, and I'll go four or five hours away, but probably not much further. But for where we are, and I, I'm based out of Cincinnati, that's a lot of tracks. Um, streetcar takeover, import face off. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not aware of any other kind of stuff, you know, around here within four or five hours or so. Um, so I got to have a look and a see, but, uh, you know, it, it kind of will depend on how much I can get done during the winter and how quickly I can get it done. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll keep that in mind and I'll share that to, to Facebook and, or YouTube or probably both. Um, so that anybody that's following along can see, you know, Hey, what, what's up, where am I going to be? Right. Yep. 
Which uh, which import faceoff do you go to? You go up to Hebron. Yeah, like uh, I think Hebron's a good track. I like going up there. Um, I uh, I didn't have the car together earlier in the year. I think they had another one that wasn't too far away. Um, oh yeah, because there's two in Ohio, isn't there? I think so. But yeah, where wherever, especially if they're gonna if they've kind of fixed things for the racers, you know, for a while there was really hard being a racer. You couldn't hear. It was hard getting through the pits, you know, it was a real party atmosphere, which I'm not getting down on that whatsoever. It just, you know, I'm trying to do racing stuff. Right. And it, if everybody else is making that hard on me, you know, it's kind of, that's not cool. Um, so if, you know, they've kind of reshuffled and moved things around to where the racers can hear their call up to the lanes and stuff like that, then cool. That's even better. Yeah, it looks like uh, the party stuff is kind of getting phased out, so... Uh, big shout out uh, to Cliff, you know, Cliff for working that working that out. Yeah, not my thing, but man, like if that's what people like, you like the sound. You know, I've got buddies who are into the sound and <clears throat> you know the the two step contest and all that stuff. You know, I'm not going to tell somebody what they like is wrong, but it just we got to respect each other, right? Like we got to work together, just just like everything else in life. I can't go through life thinking my way is the only way, uh, and that's got to be a two way street. So. As long as the event makes sense and it's smooth for everybody, then awesome. You know, I know uh, Mike was talking about um, how nobody listens to the live broadcast on 88.5 at the shootout, and that's why people don't know the, uh, you know, the times or the, the uh, staging lanes when people need to come up. But I, I just don't know that many people are listening to the radio as we're out in the pits. Maybe that's something that we can think about for next year. So Norwalk's got a really good PA system. We can usually hear what's going on overhead. Um, but the tracks where the PA system's not good, which that's Hebron, um, then, yeah, we, we we pull out our radios and we're listening to the radios. But, man, when you're trying to use this little battery-operated radio to, to hear and you got, <laughs> you know, somebody that's pushing 110 decibels over there, you know, like, it, it gets hard. Um, so, yeah, like, Norwalk's got a good PA system. Indy's got a good PA a really good PA system. Uh, but your smaller tracks, you know, Edgewater, Kilcare, uh, Hebron, you know, National Trail, stuff like that, like they, their PA systems kind of struggle to get over over the, the loud cars and loud music and yeah. stuff. Hmm. IFO tends to have a lot of pit rippers running around too. And, that, you know, I got a cool pit ripper, so I don't want to be a hypocrite, but I don't know. Like sometimes you go to tracks and there's just like a, a herd just kind of like circling the facility. Oh, yeah. And that's just like all they're doing all day. And it's like, come on, guys, like. I get it. Like, it's a lot of fun. It's a place you can go and ride that thing. But, you know, we kind of like do it in sessions. <laughs> That's how it feels at World Cup. Like, man, I got to jump around all the scooters and motorcycles and everything else in the pits. Like, man, can you guys just yeah. go to the back it's, lane? It's and a do real that? popular thing. Yeah. Edgewater is real bad for that. Like, there's some, some preteens and some teens that get on their dirt bikes and stuff and they just kind of roam around everywhere and it, it can be intrusive. Well, Sean, let's get into the social media. So uh, people out there listening, they haven't seen this car. They want to come take a look at it or, or find your YouTube channel so they can see more about the build. Go ahead and uh, let us know where we can find it. Uh, you know, I'm a boomer. I'm not I'm not really active on Instagram. I do have an Instagram. It's at Sean Wern. And my, my first name is S-H-A-U-N. And then it'd be W-E-R-N, so at Sean Wern. I'm more. I'm mostly active on Facebook and YouTube, uh, and my Facebook's just by my name, Sean Warning, and S H A U N W R N I N G, and then my YouTube channel is Fish Motorsport, and uh, not really many people have asked, but I I, I freely talk about it. It's uh, Fish is an acronym for fabrication is hard. Mm. And that's kind of a joke that that we've had internally, like my group, as we've been all coming up learning how to do this stuff. Is man, this is hard. You know, you, you look at how Morrison puts together a manifold and it's gorgeous and it just, they make it look so easy and you go and do it and you're like, oof, this looks like shit. <laughs> Why is this so hard? <laughs> um, so that's what that is. Fabrication is hard. Um, and the YouTube handle is at fish motorsport three, five, four killer. So that's, that's, that's Facebook and uh, YouTube is where, where I'm most active. Awesome. Well, Sean, at the end, I always give people a chance to uh, give thanks or give a shout out to anyone who's helped them out along the way. You got anybody that you want to give a shout out to? Yeah, man. You know, I've I've not really had a, a chance, a platform to kind of thank people individually. So, uh, you know, first and foremost, my buddy Tim Nolman. That's that's my my guy who's always up at the line with me, getting me through the water box, 
Um, and that's, that's not only what he does. Like, I don't think I know how to check tires on a car anymore. That dude always sets my tire pressure, helps me line the car up. You know, where are we going to put the tires in the groove, stuff like that. He's always over here, helping me wrench, fabricate, help me run the car, you know, talk through things. Um, so, you know, that not only does he support me, he supports our entire crew. You know, I, I, my, my other buddies are Aaron Anderson and Matt Wheatley, Joey Casarsi and Tim Mundy. They all had cars up there at shootout and Tim Nolman's had his hands in every single one of those cars. So thank you, Tim. Like we, we appreciate you very much, dude. Um, you know, my dad, I want to say thanks to my dad. Uh, he's always like one of the first people I call when I'm dealing with something weird, you know, like, man, what's this alternator doing? I'm gonna call dad. Um, after that, you know, it's, it's, it's a list of names. Matt Wheatley has been a lot of help with my car. I appreciate you, Matt. My brother Sterling, my wife Jess, Tim Mundy, Joey Casarsi, and Aaron Anderson. And then we got a guy, uh, Aaron and Matt call him crew chief, but uh, we call him Little Matt, uh, Matt <laughs> Cowart. Um, you know, we've, we've got a real solid crew of dudes, and we're not all out of Cincy. You know, we're, we're kind of spread apart, uh, you know, between Cincy and then up north, north Indiana, north-ish Indiana. So um, we make it work, and that's, that's what I tried to encourage people to do in my shootout vid was uh, go find people – that are willing to help you and want to see you succeed. And, you know, that's, that's what I've, what I've got and what we've got and we're constantly helping each other. And I love it. Heck yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, Sean, thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your story. I know, uh, people, people love your car and now I'm glad that they get to hear the, the, the man behind the wheel. Hey man, thanks. Thanks for, you know, having me here to, to talk about it. I, obviously I love to monologue and hear my own voice. <laughs> Um, I'll gladly get on and, and do tech talks or anything else. Uh, you know, I, I don't care. I, I like this stuff. This is what I want to do with my life. Heck yeah. All right, John. Well, we'll see you at the track. Thanks, Josh, man. Talk to you later. All right. Thank you for listening to the Mitsu Times podcast. Check out our Instagram and Facebook for daily updates. Get added to our list by going to mitsutimes.org and clicking submit a slip. Thank you to all of our sponsors.